Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Dr. Gail Dines. She's Professor Emerita of Sociology at Wheelock College in Boston. She's the author of multiple books and articles, has been described as the world's leading expert on the effects of pornography. She's the author of the highly acclaimed Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality, Be Compressed, and co-editor of Gender, Race, and Class in Media. Translated into four languages, Pornland is the basis of a documentary released uh, a couple of falls ago by Media Education Foundation. Dr. Dines is president and CEO of Culture Reframed, a nonprofit organization composed of academics, professionals, and activists from a wide range of perspectives that's dedicated to raising awareness about the impacts of pornography on children, youth, and adults. If you want to know more about her work, you can go to her website, www.gaildines.com. So first off, thank you for all your work in the world. And second, thank you for being on the program. Well, it's a pleasure always to speak to you, Derek. Thank you. Um, so in our previous interviews, we have talked about um, just the, 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 the terrible harm that, that often comes to women um, in pornography and in pornography in general, and then also in pornography that you've repeatedly described as body punishing, just stuff that I don't even want to imagine. And uh, if you want to talk about that a little bit, that's okay. And you've also talked about how porn is really big business. It's not, it's, it, it, it you've talked, if, we, if we're going to talk about pornography, we have to talk about money. So if you want to talk about those a little bit, that's great. But at the same time, I would like to sort of take those as a given and today focus on um, the more mainstreamation of porn uh, tropes and pornography. And one small example, just last night I was watching, um, I, I'm finally getting around to watching Westward, Westworld, and um, there was a scene in which um, a man uh, during sex, I guess you'd call it, strangles a woman. And this is something that was completely unheard of. I, I never even heard of this until, until, frankly, you brought it to my attention through its existence in porn. And now it's in a mainstream TV show. So I'll just shut up now and you can take any of this anywhere you want. Well, I think you're right. We have spoken about porn and the violence that's now mainstream in porn. Um, I do think just one thing to say to your listeners that what's not really understood when we talk about porn or is a lot less understood is the way it is a multi-billion dollar business. A lot of people who are pro-porn tend to talk about it as a collection of images that somehow just came out of nowhere. And what they don't focus on is how porn is produced, the business model, the value chains, and really the way in which you need racism, sexism, and globalization to be the factors that are the perfect storm for the production and distribution of pornography. Because once you have racism, sexism, poverty all over the world, then you have a steady stream of women, especially women of color, into the porn industry. So I think what people don't get often when I debate them is when they talk about porn is they forget it's an industry. It's like talking about, you know, hamburgers you buy from a shop, but you don't happen to mention the fast food industry. And the big issue I want to, that's important here is what people don't know is that really one company, MindGeek, based in Luxembourg with most of its offices in Montreal, controls the vast majority of porn distributed in the porn free sites because they own the porn and the free porn sites. So um, I just wanted to put that in to get people to think about it, because I know many of your listeners have a more left critical analysis. And yet often what I found when I'm speaking to people on the left is they will have a critical analysis of capitalism. And this is especially true of men. When it comes to discussing porn, somehow they forget their leftists. They forget they critique capitalism. They forget about the power of uh, businesses and industries. And they become pro-porn as if it just happened to be in the culture without actually being embedded in capitalism. So I just ask your listeners out there who are left and have a good structural analysis of economics to really put, apply that to pornography the next time they think about going to the porn industry. That's great. Thank you. And um, yeah, I, I want to mention one thing about business. You said it, it is big business. And I just read a couple days ago that one third of 1% of all global 
greenhouse gas emissions come from streaming pornography. And, and that, 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 that's, that's one third of 1% of something doesn't sound like a lot, except when you're talking about, I mean, this includes the cement industry. This includes deforestation. I mean, that's, that's actually a huge amount. It's, it's a mind bogglingly large amount of pornography. Oh, it's, I mean, when people realize how deeply embedded porn is, and this sort of gets onto your next issue and how large of an industry it is, by the way, the only multi-billion dollar above ground industry that is completely um, unregulated. No other industry is so, un, is so deeply unregulated. Um, and also the way in which, because it's so large, because capital is concentrated mainly in one company, that gives that company enormous cultural, social, economic, political and legal power. And what you see is, you know, they have their own um, lobbying organization called the Free Speech Coalition. I mean, what bigger joke can you have when the porn industry tries to close down everybody's speech who is against porn? But they call it's called the Free Speech Coalition is they manage to really, when they do their work of lobbying, it's not just about lobbying politicians, they also lobby the media. So when you see things like strangulation, as you said in Westworld, I want you to think of something about what goes on in L.A. So much of the porn that is produced is produced in the valley in L.A. And what we know is that the people who produce it, which includes, remember, camera people, sound, technicians, all of those. They also work in the mainstream um, media industry. So they could very well be shooting a porn scene in the morning and going off to shoot Westworld in the afternoon. So what you see is a mixture of porn infiltrating mainstream culture, often because the same people are producing both in terms of the technical side. And also pornography is not simply about sex. Porn is a narrative about sex, about gender, about power, about relationships, about masculinity, femininity. It really provides stories and narratives about what those mean in this culture. And those stories and narratives, and of course the key story in pornography is that women equal trash to be used and abused by men sexually in any way they want. Women don't matter. Women are fuckable and you, uh, you get rid of them when you're done and that men are in power by virtue of their biological supremacy because it's a really reactionary um, narrative in pornography that this is a biological reality men are more powerful women are weaker that kind of narrative seeps in both to mainstream media and into the hegemony of the way we think about uh, sex and gender. So I think we have to get out of the idea that porn equals sex and think about porn as a narrative about the world and the way we live. And to be honest, when you think of the world we live in now and we think of Trump and we think of all these right wing crazy men who are taking over all over the world, you can see that porn is the perfect type of. So, you know, I'm putting sex in quotes here for these guys. You know, they're violent, angry, misogynist. What better sexuality to develop than a pornographic one, given who they are and given the kind of world that they're producing and the way in which, uh, you know, men's rage is now being given is about free range in our culture, men's anger, men's frustration. All of this is now the lid has come off because, you know, the last time we spoke, I don't think Trump was in power. And just let's think of the vast changes and what Trump has unleashed also all over the world with all the other crazy Trumps in other countries. So for me, what's scary is that we've kind of given a range to a type of masculinity that is going to kill everything, including the planet, women, children, everything around it. We cannot survive any of us in a world where these men basically run everything it's scary as hell i want to and thank you for that i, I want to back up a second and and um i remember my mom died last year and before, oh, sorry. oh thank you and one of the things that we used to do sometimes is watch those true crime mysteries line or 2020 or whatever she really enjoyed those in her 80s and um i remember one that was about a guy who was not very attractive and he somehow made a whole bunch of money. I don't know if he was in tech or something. And then he basically um, 
would then pay all of these women, some of whom were in Playboy, to, to quote, date him. And the reason I bring all this up is because the narrators, with no sense of, 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 uh, of what they were saying, seemingly, kept going on about how this guy was living the dream. It struck me as really odd. It's like none of these women would have anything. He would have to pay them like $100,000 a night to stay with him. And I don't think having to pay someone for company is living the dream. But my point is that this was reframed as, oh, and they were saying, this is every man's dream. And that's really what I want to get at is, is and that, that sort of gets to, 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 to part of, this is a discussion that, that me and our, our mutual friend, Lear Keith, have had quite a lot. It's like, which is actually worse for women? The sort of hardcore porn that some people watch or the same attitudes expressed in a softer fashion to a, an audience that is huge, even huger. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, but I think the, it's not an either or situation. Each one strengthens the power of the other. The fact that the pornification of our culture is now mainstream and the fact that porn mainstream porn is hardcore, um, really work up each other. There's a reason why mainstream um, media has become softcore porn. It's because what the porn industry produces today is only hardcore. So softcore has migrated into pop culture. But if you bring boys and men up on softcore porn, you groom them into getting ready for the hardcore porn. I mean, you know, I people often talk about pornography on a continuum. But when you look at hardcore porn, well, which is mainstream, again, I have to say the mainstream porn, I call it hardcore, but it's mainstream. It's what you get in 10 seconds when you put porn into Google and you get it for free. The question that always, well, there's a couple of questions that come to me. The first one is, how do boys who often by the age of 11 are watching it stand to see this violence? And really, the fact is, although we talk about it as a continuum, there is nothing quite like it. it softcore is a very different animal to, oh, I hate to use the word animal, I shouldn't for porn because it's so different. It's, softcore is such a different um, conceptual tool than hardcore because form, softcore... Form of propaganda. So, I'm sorry? It's a different form of propaganda. Yes, and it's also to the body. I'm talking about as the body. You know, when we talk about the continuum of softcore to hardcore porn, and you think of Playboy, or you think of mainstream pop culture, and then you think of the mainstream hardcore porn on you on Pornhub and you porn, you know, there's something different in the body and the way they ex you experience it. Certainly true for men, because when you look at men who are addicted to porn, they're not addicted to Playboy or Penthouse. They're addicted to the mainstream hardcore. And I know myself when I'm studying pornography that when I'm looking, which is not much in Playboy or Penthouse to look at now, given that they're both more or less bankrupt, but when I look at the image of the old pinup or the woman smiling in a cornfield with no clothes on versus what we see today, I know in my body the response. I kind of get, I have to fight not to go into a dissociative state when I'm watching hardcore porn because it's so utterly violent and brutal. And we know that most men, when they go and talk about uh, porn addicts and boys, they're not addicted to Playboy. They're addicted to the hardcore. So I think what we, when we think about being saturated in a porn culture, that's a critical concept. But also we have to separate out what is going on in the body of men and the small percentage of women who use hardcore porn as well that is so viscerally different to what we've been used to. And this is never really discussed in the literature, in the academy, or really anywhere else. People talk about, well, we've always had porn. No, we've not always had this kind of porn, you know, with um, a click away. That's free. And that is going to shift the sexual template, the bodily experiences of men on a micro level. And on a macro level, it's going to shift the culture. Because these very men who were brought up on this hardcore vile, you know, pornography that's based around torture although it's mainstream are then going to go into the world and they're going to become presidents and lawyers 
and politicians and doctors and all of these things. So, I mean, my question is, what kind of a sustainable world are we creating when we bring up the next generation of men on hardcore porn as the norm? I don't think it is sustainable. I think porn is actual cultural suicide. And I think we're beginning to see some of the effects of this when we look around the world and we see these men in power because somebody put these men in power. They got voted in and um, a lot of them got voted in by people, especially men who think like they do and who've been brought up on porn, which makes you angry, it makes you violent. It takes away your capacity for empathy. I mean, if you want to think about one thing that this world lacks today, it's empathy. You know, if we were true empathic human beings, we would not have the world that we have today. And we know from studies, by the way, there's studies that follow generations and study how much empathy they've got. And every generation is coming out with less empathy than the previous generation. Yeah, I, I believe that the studies I've seen have attempt to quantify it. And it's like empathy has decreased by 70 percent between 1980 and 2011, I, I believe it was. Oh, my God. I didn't know it was that bad. Oh, my God. Yeah, and they, they were the, – the way they quantified it was by asking – because I thought, how do you quantify em empathy? That seems crazy. Um, they would ask questions like, if, you ha if you're having lunch and you have two sandwiches and your friend is sitting across from you without a sandwich, will you offer your friend a sandwich? And however many – I mean, obviously, a more empathetic person would be more likely to offer their friend a sandwich. So – it's, it's questions like that that established. And, it, and they said most of the decline was from 2000 to 2011. And the study ended in 2011. And God only knows how it's gone down since then. Um, and, of course, you know what happened in 2000 was porn became mainstream on the Internet. That was the year it started. Right. So can you can you what do you mean by cultural suicide? Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yes. I mean, I don't think we can live in a world that is you know, tolerable, bearable, or gives us what we need to survive and thrive as human beings, where the men have been socialized and groomed by hardcore porn because of the way they think of women and ultimately children as well. And especially, you know, we know the image of women in porn is getting younger. The One of the most searched uh, porn sites is teen porn, what search terms is teen porn. So what happens when we start to turn on our young as well? We know that from FBI and Interpol that every child porn site they take down is more violent than the previous one, to the point that the last time they said they had never seen anything in their life like the international. They, they, they took down an international child porn site and they said they'd never seen anything ever like that before. And these are, you know, guys who are pretty hardened to this kind of stuff. And for them, it was unbearable. So, I, I mean, what happens when you turn on your young to that degree? And then what happens when men who do, sadly, in patriarchy rule the world, when you've got men who are like kind of a bit like the straw, you know, the straw man from um, The Wizard of Oz, lacking a heart? Um, what, what does it mean for the rest of us? And I think I'll give you an example. I was speaking to somebody recently who is a nurse who specializes in um, child on child sexual abuse. And she does the intake. And she was saying she had a case where um, in a, recently in a school and she said this is not uncommon where a girl was raped in the bathroom by three men and outside by three boys. I'm sorry, not uh, men, by three boys. And outside the bathroom were all the boys cheering the boys in the bathroom on. Now, if that's not a sign of lack of empathy, that not one of them stopped. And then you look at other examples of where kids tape other kids raping girls and no one thinks to stop it. Um, what does it say about the kind of kids we're creating and then put some power in their hands as they get older to, you know, make decisions about the state of the world? And you, you've got a disaster. You've got a complete recipe for disaster. So this is what I don't see is how and the problems that are facing us. And I mean, I'm preaching to you about, you know, global change and the world getting destroyed, etc. I mean, how are we going to stop that? 
I mean, even if we stop today, we still cannot, as you well know, and you've written so perfectly about, undo the damage. But these are not people who are thinking in those terms. People brought up on pornography are not worried about the state of the, uh, the air we breathe or the state of the earth or animals. You know, they're worried about one thing and one thing only. It's how quickly can they get off? And that's the only thing that matters to them. So, I mean, it just feels like everything's going to fall apart. And I don't want to say that as an activist because I don't want people to feel hopeless. But, you know, for those of us in this world who do the work, and I'm sure you often feel it, is how are we going to get people to wake up and realize we haven't got um, the luxury of time? Well, the messes we've made, we have to start mopping up right now, this second, if we've got any hope of surviving. I mean, you must feel the same way, Derek. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a line that I've said a line I've said quite a bit is um, when adults, when adult humans are raping child humans, what hope is there for these people caring about the salmon? It's like fathers are raping their own daughters, you know, then, then, then someone that you're supposed to, you're supposed to care about and love and nurture, then what hope is there when there's not that, familial connection or even species connection. Um, there's a couple directions I want to go with this. One of them is that a very important thing for my understanding of the spectacle and of pornography came in reading Randy Schilt's book and the band played on and mm. about the AIDS crisis. And, yeah, the AIDS. Yeah. and at one point, Randy Schilt, who participated in the bathhouse culture, um, was writing about some of the things that were, that would happen, in, that would happen in the bathhouses, like, and the one he uses is, is anal fisting. And mm. He, he, he made this, and I read this when I was pretty, pretty young, so, you know, it was in my late 20s, early 30s, and I, I, he had this line that really hit me very hard and influenced everything I think about everything, which was, if you remove the connection, the human connection from sex, and it becomes purely about physical stimulation, then over time, that stimulation has to grow greater and greater to keep from getting boring. And that applies across the board to, you know, rock and roll concerts have to get more and more of a spectacle. Uh, the Coliseum had to get more and more of a spectacle. And that, that helped me understand sort of how one of the reasons that pornography has to keep pushing the boundaries is because there's no human connection to – I'll, I'll just stop, and, and you can take that anywhere you want. Well, um, and remember that in porn there's no pleasure for women. That doesn't exist. I mean, they pretend it. So any sort of sexual pleasure, and just let's reduce it to basically an orgasm, is men, not women – um, they're just trying to survive the onslaught on their bodies. And I, I think that's true. When you actually, which is what porn does best, sever um, sex from connection, empathy, relationships, intimacy, then it gets very boring very quickly, which is why we've seen porn become so violent, because you have to keep the interest going. And actually, the, the I think the stimulation in porn today for men is less about the sex and more is how can they break her? They actually say that during the movies. I mean, how much can she tolerate before she breaks? And they, I won't use the language that they use in porn, but that's often. And what was interesting when I was writing Pornland, I was on the sites, the discussion boards where all these, you know, porn aficionados go. And the threads that got the longest response was, can someone show me or tell me about a film where the bitch can't take it anymore and she collapses. And these threads would have like four or five hundred responses. Yeah, go to this film and look at three minutes, 20 seconds, she almost passes out. These would be hundreds and hundreds of writers coming in, of uh, porn users telling them exactly. Or go to this film and at two minutes, 40 seconds, she vomits and she they keep the vomit in. And I was just reading these threads of these guys were like such experts at which films to go to where the woman just basically fell apart during the making of the film. I mean, and you think to yourself, you know, that's what 
seemed to excite them the most. That's what got them off. Not even the sex. It was the violence. And then, of course, when you sexualize violence against women, you render the violence invisible and we think of it as sex. But what we're really talking about is a culture of absolute violence and sex is the vehicle, but it's really violence. But for men, sex is always weaponized against women in patriarchy. I mean, they weaponize their penises, they weaponize their sex, and women and children become the collateral damage of that. So there's a whole bunch of directions I would like to go from here. One, one of them is, is I was writing a book on, um, on some problems in anarchism and uh, there, there, there has been over the, the decades a lot of anarchist support for pedophilia among some strains of anarchism. And I was reading some accounts, and I remember during during one of those research sessions, I I I started to just hyperventilate. I could bear. I started decompensating. Is what I started to do because it was so bad. It was this particular one was uh, there was a. A, an organization in Germany that was a, a, a refuge house for girls who had been sexually abused and some anarchists fomented a conflict with that safe house suggesting, it's not suggesting, stating that the people at the safe house were oppressing the girls by not allowing those girls to have sexual relations with the adult anarchists. And oh, when I read this, I couldn't stop crying. So when you're going to those message boards, and I recognize that what I went through with that or what you go through with what you went through is nothing compared to the actual primary victims. But how did you how did you survive doing that research? I cried a lot. I mean, I cried a lot when I wrote Pornland. Um, I remember some, um, I was being filmed for a documentary and the documentary filmmaker said, um, he said, I wept as I read your book. And I said, well, that's OK. I wept as I wrote it. So you just picked up the feeling as well. I mean, you cry a lot, I think, which is a good thing. I do a lot of uh, mind body work. And also, you know, as I've had the same partner since I was 18, who is the least creepy sexual, <laughs> the least sexually creepy person I know, is one of the kindest, gentlest people I know. And um I have a son who is one of the, again, the kindest, gentlest I know. And I have to say about my partner, David, is what he's known his entire life is when he needs to stand either behind me, by my side or in front of me. And, you know, many men, when they partner with strong women, they partner with them so they can destroy them. They think they like the strength of strong women, but they don't. And then they set out to, you know, rip them into shreds piece by piece. I was lucky enough to find a man who actually not only loved strong women, but wanted to help make strong women stronger. And I think that has helped really sustain me. And then I have to talk about, you know, my wonderful friends, radical feminist community who, and of course, Lier, as you well know, has been a part of my life for many years as well. And, um, you know, when I was writing Pornland, I had at least, you know, a group of women and also people like Bob Jensen, where if it was too bad, I could just write an email to say I'm in porn hell and everyone would come to support me. So I've had a lot of support. But I have to say, I mean, I cannot unsee what I have seen and I will have to live with that for the rest of my life. But once I saw it, I had no choice. It's not like there was a choice there. Once I saw it and I knew I would never unsee it for my sake of sanity, I had to dedicate my life to fighting that industry and to fighting patriarchy and violence against women. That's how I stay sane as being an activist. Otherwise, I think I would go mad. So I've had many ways I've managed this. But we, we all have, you know, battle scars from this. We can't come out of this unscathed. But that's the reality of the world we live in. One of the things that, that gets me through when I'm doing especially difficult research is the understanding that I'm simply doing research and I'm not the woman who is vomiting. You know, it's like I can look away and I can go take a walk and she can't. Well, you see, I think me being a woman, gives, I, I 
it, I actually feel myself when she's choking, I feel myself choking. It, when, when I watch the porn where they which is most porn where they begin by gagging her with a piece, I actually start to gag myself. And I think it's partly my connection as a woman with the woman up there thinking, and I, many times I do think to myself, if I was her, I would never get up off that floor. I, I don't know how she survives it. Uh, but yes, we always have to remember I can switch off the computer. I can get away from that. This is her life. This is her life. And, and what I often worry about is that I know that, you know, women in porn can only survive about three months um, because of the bodily injury and the STDs. And while they're in porn and having to survive, the focus is on survival. It's when they leave the industry that the crash and burn happens. And then you think, who's there to pick up the pieces? And I have to say, there was something very interesting that happened, is that when the Me Too movement started, and all, you know, women were coming out with stories and after story, do you know that I think it was five women in the porn industry in the early days of the Me Too committed suicide? And it was very interesting. It was a whole cluster of them. And I was thinking, why now? during the Me Too, and then it was very obvious to me, because they know they will never have their Me Too moment. They know that nobody will ever bear witness to their rape and abuse, because they were in porn, so clearly they were a bunch of sluts and whores, and who cares about them? And Because I was reading the business, the porn business press, and literally, each week another woman was killing herself. And it really stuck with me that, that you know, they know, and it's probably true from women who exit prostitution, and who's going to bear witness to what happened to them? Because we think of them, or we don't, but, you know, the culture thinks of them as a bunch of sluts who deserved it. Um, and really, if you've been through trauma, as we know from Judith Herman's book, you need people to bear witness to it. You, you cannot bear witness. You cannot survive without somebody bearing witness to that level of pain. And I think that's what happened to these women in the porn industry. They knew no one would bear witness. So earlier, earlier you said that um, that a lot of lefty males will uh, have may may have great class analysis when it comes to sweatshops or whatever, or capitalism in general. But but when it comes to porn, they um, that that disappears. So one of the things I've certainly noticed is that um, you know they talk about don't kink shame. And it, it seems like if a male orgasm is involved, that no social analysis is allowed. So there's that point. And then also, can you talk about the role of academia in promoting pornography and attacking those who um, oppose this exploitation of women? Can you, can you put those three together? What kink shaming, academia, and what was the other one? The the fact that you can't uh, that if a man has an orgasm, then suddenly it's off limits to discuss social implications. Well, um, let me start with one of the most familiar with, and then bring the other two in about academia. I mean, I you know was an academic for thirty odd years, and I watched the academy, especially women's studies, going go from anti porn to pro porn, and it was almost you know, unbearable to see what was going on. And it got to the point where, you know, every book coming out about pornography was pro-porn. It got to the point, I, I went, I'll give you an example. I went, I was speaking at the National Women's Studies Association Conference. Now, these are academic conferences. So there is some form of, you know, regard of how one treats one's colleagues, even if you disagree. So I'm giving um, a presentation actually on racism in porn and what happens to women of colour. And it's a packed room. And a group of women who are pro-porn academics stood up, one of them, and she screams at me. In the middle of me speaking, Gail Dines, I withdraw your right to do this research. Now, first of all, who speaks like that at an academic conference? And then I said, well, I'm sorry, but you don't actually get that right. And please sit down till I finish and then we'll talk. But I mean, it got so nasty and so vicious in the academy. So I think there's a number of reasons. 
I think some of these women who are pro-porn have been groomed by the porn culture. They themselves see themselves in a pornographic way. I also think you're in a very difficult profession because of tenure, where you're up or out. And I think that if you are, I don't think I would get tenure today. In fact, I don't think I'd get a job today, to be honest with you. I would not get a job on a tenure track position in academia with my politics today. I would definitely not get one. I was very lucky that I got in before this. And I think for many women in academia today, when they, they drink the Kool-Aid, uh, they want tenure, they want the brownie points from the boys, and they're not going to get that if they're anti-porn. I think queer theory and neoliberalism has also had a terrible impact on the sort of capacity to understand pornography as violence against women in production and consumption. I think the notion that male orgasm is the most important thing speaks to the porn culture we live in. I mean, it's, we don't talk about female pleasure. Right? Female pleasure comes from giving him an orgasm. That's the way you get pleasure uh, in our culture. It's sort of instead of Munhausen by proxy, it's pleasure by proxy. You know, his pleasure becomes your pleasure, your reflected glory that you got him off. So um, I think if you mix all of those things together and then the general degrading of the intellectual project that's going on in academia, the silencing of people who don't follow the party line and just the idea that we're now so steeped in a culture of pornography. You have to put all those together. And I would also argue the lack of training or being steeped in a critical analysis that comes out of, I would say, beginning with Marxism and then radical feminism. I know for me, what gave me the concepts and the ability to understand pornography was not first radical feminism. It was actually Marxism. And, you know, when I went to school in England to get my Ph.D., and I did it in sociology, you, you always came out of Marxist. There was no way you could escape it. And it was just such an important paradigm for me to understand pornography. And then when I read radical feminism and put that together with um, Marxism, then it became, you know, how could you possibly be pro-porn? It made no sense when you have a structural critical analysis of the world. What do we do about academia and is it, how, is it possible to turn around some of the harmful effects of postmodernism, neoliberalism, and queer theory on the academy? Because um, the, the academy is just, is a, is, I, I go back and forth as to whether it's a nightmare or a circus. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's just the, the insanity that, that comes out of, of the academy is, is pretty stunning to me. Is there, is there much hope for that, for, for changing that, or what, what do we do? Well, you know, you know, what, you know what? If, if we do change it, it's not going to come from the professors. It's going to come from the students. I have to say, I have, you know, on my, on Facebook, um, I know you and I are friends and I have to see your posts and you see mine. And, you know, I have, I've reached my 5,000 limit. And what I see is that it's often young women on my Facebook page are hungry for radical feminist analysis. They're what, they're hungry for critical analysis. What I would think we should do, and I'm throwing out a challenge to you and every other, you know, lefty and feminist and radical fan, is I think we should start having courses online that start laying the foundation for radical ways of thinking. We bypass the academy. And I think if we offer courses, students will come because they are so hungry. I remember this in my classes. They would come in on day one. And, you know, I would say to them, how many of you are feminists? And maybe out of 30, two hands would go up. By week three, they were having debates about they didn't know whether they were radical socialist or Marxist feminists. This would be it just took three weeks to shift them into being feminists. And what was so interesting is when I did the stuff on Marx and, would you know, we'd read Marx and. They would love it. I never had a student in 30 odd years who didn't love reading Marx. Can you believe that in the United States of America? So I believe if we we bypass the academy and those of us who sort of do this work, we think about how can we develop a platform where we start having giving lectures? You give one. 
I give one, we bring in other people. The air gives one, all the people that we know, Bob Jensen, where we have a sort of radical school online. Because to do it in an actual physical place would be too costly for many people to get to. And I think an online course where we start rebuilding critical analysis in young people, that's the way we do this. You know, if you're serious about this, um, I'm in. Yeah, I am deadly serious. I've been thinking about this for a long time because I often have people on my Facebook page saying, I wish you would run a course on radical feminism. I'm sure you probably get the same thing. I wish you could, we could come and hear you or you do a course. I am deadly serious and have been thinking about this for a very, very long time. So I'm, I'm organizationally, uh, inept. So, um, I will be happy to participate. Uh, I, you or somebody else needs to come up with the actual structure. Well, that's the problem is that, um, we have to find somebody because I am now, I have to tell you, I run, I'm, you know, a president of a non-profit. It is the hardest work I have ever done in my life. I work day and night, weekends. If somebody is out there listening to this who is not organizationally challenged, who knows as well how to set up um, the platform for us to do this, then we could start thinking between us who we would have on this course and we could advertise it through our Facebook pages and elsewhere. So I think is anyone out there listening to this who would like to take on the challenge of help organizing this, it would be wonderful. But at this moment in my life, I have to say, I did not think that at my age, I would end up working twice as hard as I've ever worked in my life. It is really anyone who's spent their lives in the nonprofit world. I have got nothing but the utmost respect for them because academia is indeed the ivory tower compared to this. So this 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 conversation we're having right now, yes. So that I I would encourage someone to contact us. Uh, Absolutely. And then this reminds me of a conversation you and I had over dinner one time, where it was a book that you and I talked about that never came to be. But I would love it if we could instead of a book, if we could do it this way too. It was going to be how neolib- neoliberalism has destroyed everything it touches, and we were going to have a book with with. You or someone talking about how neoliberalism has harmed um, feminism, and I could do how neoliberalism has harmed environmentalism. Somebody else could talk about how neoliberalism has harmed um, African Americans. Um, we could, and, and that could be one of the that could be one of the sections of this. Of this could be could be that book eventually turning into this this a course series. Absolutely, and then I think. We would want to sort of have sections on critical thinkers and walk people through the main concepts of people like Marx, Gramsci, Andrea Dworkin, Mary Daly. I mean, actually, I did a few years ago, I did um, at the New Left Forum, I did um, a panel with um, Chris Hedges and Richard Wall, and it was on near, it was on Marxism. And um, Chris Hedges talked about one section of Marxism, Richard Wolff, another, and I did Marxism and feminism. Again, it was packed and people loved it. People loved it because they are starving for stuff that makes sense for themselves. You, you literally feel in this world, if you have not got access to structural left feminist radical views, you literally feel like you're going insane. You do. You think you are alone and you look around the world and you think, how did it get to this? And am I the only person who feels this way? I know that my Facebook page does play somewhat of a role of helping to keep a bit of sanity for people who are feel alone. I'm sure your Facebook pages and I'm sure we can mention many people who do. But could you imagine a course where we actually people felt that was some community as well? And we could build in not just on the course, we could actually build in a meeting face to face time in a location and get somebody to organize a place where we meet as a a conference. But we need we've lost the face to face bit as well. We've lost community. And in a world that's going mad, when you lose community, that is a recipe for losing sanity. So we have about four or five minutes left. And. Um, there, there's something I want to bring up that I, I think we've talked about before, but it, it just it, it's something that always strikes me about the 
complete insanity of of porn culture. And that's I was I was having a discussion several years ago with a famous um, actress whom I'm not going to name, who is you know routinely in like the lists of the top 50 most beautiful women of the world. And we were talking about pornography and how much she hates pornography. And she said to me that she had broken up with several boyfriends because they wouldn't stop using porn. And in fact, some of them had enacted porn, uh, some of the, the porn based violence upon her. And when she was telling me this, I was just flabbergasted because it's extraordinary to me that she was considered one of the top most literally beautiful women in the world. If we, you know, let's, let's not go into the whole beauty standard thing for a second. Let's, let's not talk about how bogus, you know, the male gaze, all that stuff. We understand, you and I both understand that, but even according to the patriarchal standards, she's, she's, you know, sort of top of the line. And yet still men would use porn even when she said, don't do it or I will break up with you. So they actually have, do you see what I'm getting at? They, have, mm -hmm. they, they are with, they are in bed with the woman that other men are fantasizing about. And then they would prefer to use the image. It's just, I was, I was kind of speechless when she was telling me this. Well, I think that tells you about the power of the image, which is more hyper real than actual reality. And whatever she offers them sexually, it can't compete with pornography. I mean, when they did, when they mapped the brains of porn users who are habitual users or addicts, you know that porn releases more dopamine than cocaine, heroin, and is on the same level as methamphetamine. So that's the dopamine hit they get. So what she can't compete with is the dopamine hit. That's why they'd rather be with their porn. And she wouldn't do probably what was in porn. And so it's like asking a whiskey drinker to go back to beer. It's not interesting. No matter even if she conformed to the most stringent beauty standard we've ever had, she didn't do it for them because that's not what they want. They want the violence. They want the degradation. This is what makes porn hot. It's not how good looking the woman is or how much she conforms to the beauty standards. It's how much you can degrade her, debase her, destroy her. That's why it makes perfect sense to me why you can be with the who's considered the most beautiful woman in the world and still be completely dissatisfied and want you porn because porn offers you a whole different set of things that she's not offering. And we have trained men to want what porn offers, not what real human beings offer. And it makes so clear, as you have made so clear in all your work, that ultimately pornography is not, I mean, it's not certainly not about making love. That's for darn sure. It's making hate. Making hate is how I refer to it. In porn, men make hate to women. Yeah. And, and it's not even about sex as such. It's, as you said, making hate. So we have like a minute left. How just are there questions I haven't asked that you want to answer? What do you what do you want to say to sum up all the wonderful things you've said? What I want to say, I think, is I've done this work for 30 odd years and I, will, you know, carry on doing it till literally I keel over um, because I'm so driven by this. And what I want to say to young women and young men is that, you know, First of all, I'm sorry for the world that my generation has left you. I apologize. But, you know, there's those of us out there who want to make this better, who want to improve it. And I would love for the younger groups to take control because clearly our generation has completely fucked everything up. There's a, you know, still a handful of us left. Hopefully that's got some sanity, but not on the whole. And for young people not to despair, but to find ways with each other to create a world and a planet that is livable because, you know, despair is to do the work of the devil. It really is. We do the work of our enemies. When we despair, we give up. And the more we give up, the better our enemies have it. So I would really say we've got to find ways that we can join and form communities that will sustain us all in this battle for a safe, sane, wonderful and joyful world that we all deserve, but especially the younger people. 
That would be a wonderful way to end, but I just thought of another question. And it is, what especially, you know, we were talking about porn culture. We're talking about me just having seen this dreadful episode of Westworld last night. What can you say to, you, you, I love what you just said, and can you talk specifically for a moment to young creators of culture, by which I mean art, writing, screenwriters, what can they do to change, to, to push back against porn culture's mainstreamization and to push forward toward um, uh, artistic depictions that uh, celebrate, that, that make, that, that, that when they when they have to do anything with sexuality, they are aiming us away from porn culture and toward a culture of relationship. Well, I don't think they're going to really have much success within the mainstream pop culture industry. I don't think that because, you know, the writers are employed and thrown out. And employed. I think this is one place where we can use social media in a really positive way, is that they start producing alternative media in ways that make it more compelling than the crap we get from pop culture. I, I cannot imagine, you know, HBO or, C, or, you know, ABC or NBC, I cannot imagine them allowing a kind of counter-hegemonic, radical um, storylines or shows. They only allow so much. But if they started creating their own culture and we suddenly got a taste for something different, because once you give people a taste for something different, that's got freedom, joy, liberation in it, you know, you get you become insatiable. You can't get enough of it. So I would say, you know, stay away from the poisonous capitalist pop culture and start to create your own stuff. It's amazing how these young influencers on YouTube are followed. Now, most of them, of course, are working for profit and a part of the system. But we can use this against the system as well. And we need to be doing that more and more. Well, thank you so much for all of that. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Gail Dines. This is Derek Jensen from Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>